thoughts of goodwill for all the world. That you don't wish anyone any harm. You wish that all beings could find happiness. And since that's our wish, why are we sitting here with our eyes closed? Why are we out there making other people happy? Well, happiness is something that has to come from within. It's based on being skillful in the way you act. And here the word action covers not only physical actions, but also your speech and the actions of your mind. In particular, the act of intention, because it's through our intentions that we shape the world we experience, the amount of pleasure or pain we take out of that experience. And because it's a skill, nobody else can make anyone else skillful. You can give other people advice. You can show them to some extent how you do things. But for people to find happiness, for anybody to find happiness, requires that we take the issue of happiness seriously and that we learn how to be skillful in our actions, skillful in our approach to happiness. It means we have to pay attention to what we're doing, saying, thinking. This is why we meditate, to get the mind very attentive, continually attentive to what it's doing. So even though there's the quest for peace, the quest for stillness in the mind, it's not just peace and stillness for its own sake, it's for the sake of understanding. How suffering comes what you're doing to cause it and what you can do to stop it. That's the purpose of our understanding. Last week I was teaching up in Canada. The question came up that isn't the purpose of all this practice to find the ultimate truth about things? And the answer is no. You find what truths there are for the purpose of happiness. It's truth with a purpose. Because there are many truths out in the world. We talk about, talk about how lasting things are. We could talk about how ephemeral they are. We can talk about the happiness in relationships, and there really is happiness in relationships. But we can also talk about the suffering. It's there, too. Once, when I was first staying with a John Fuang, there was another young monk who had ordained at his fiancée's request. She wanted to make sure her husband had had some training as a monk before they got married. So he spent two weeks out at the monastery, and one that he liked the life of a monk a lot more than he expected. So the night came when his parents and fiancée came to pick him up to take him back to disrobe in Bangkok. And the John Fu could sense that he was getting a little reluctant to go. So he gave a talk that night on how we're not born alone. We're born from our parents. We owe a debt to our parents. And it's important that we repay that debt. A few days later, I was beginning to get concerned about my debt to my father. And as John Fuang said, well, you know, we came into this world, we come alone, you know, nobody comes with us. Two different truths. Both true. And the question is learning how to use those truths properly in their, within the right context. So it's the uses of these truths that's important. And the ultimate use is finding 
how it is that we create a lot of unnecessary stress and suffering for ourselves and how we can put an end to it. That's why we train the mind. So to see, the see these things clearly, we have to get the mind still, get the mind with one object so it can settle down and have a good solid foundation that's not shifting around all the time. The more you shift around, the less you see. You might think that the more territory you cover, the more sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations you'll see. But those things don't last. Your memory of those things is very impermanent. So when you're gathering up that kind of outer wealth, the wealth of experiences, you find that it doesn't stay the same. It's like buying a huge shipload of lettuce, thinking you'll have all the lettuce you'll ever need for your life. And then, of course, it turns out that the lettuce begins to grow rotten pretty fast. And after all, you can't use it. What you need is to gather the kind of knowledge that doesn't change. And that doesn't require that you know a lot of things outside, but it does require that you know your mind very thoroughly. How does your mind process things? That's where the stress and suffering come from. When the Buddha explained the, the causes of stress and suffering, it's a very elaborate chain of causes. It starts with ignorance and goes through many different factors. But it's important to notice that a lot of the factors come prior to your sensory experience. In other words, it's all about what you bring to the experience. That's what makes all the difference, which is why we train the mind, so that it brings the right qualities, the right intentions, the right attention, paying attention to where they're stressed, not what you can do to put an end to it, by focusing on what you did to cause it. That kind of knowledge is useful in all circumstances, since so you're always bringing the right attitudes, always bringing the right qualities, no matter what the situation. So we start out here with our eyes closed, sitting still, so we can get the mind to settle down, so we can see it, so we can develop some of these skills. But it's not just so that we can sit here with our eyes closed so that we can bring these skills to any situation, no matter what, no matter how complex, no matter how, how large and complicated. If we can bring the right attitudes to those situations, we don't have to suffer, and we don't have to cause suffering for other people. They may not like what we say or do, because you can't have any control over people's likes, and people's likes are pretty unreliable. But you're not going to cause anyone any harm. So this is the kind of knowledge, these are the kind of truths we're looking for. The truth of, what are you doing right now? What is your intention right now? Is it a skillful intention? And skillful doesn't mean just good, because you can have good intentions for beings, but you can also have a lot of delusion at the same time, in which case your intention is not really skillful. You're looking for intentions that aren't founded on greed, aren't founded on aversion, and are not founded on delusion. That's what we're trying to work for. That means you have to start with something really simple and very obvious, like the breath. Just be with the breath as it comes in, be with the breath as it goes out. And part of the mind will complain that there's not much happening. But the more space you give to the breath, the more you see that it's there. In other words, you don't want to clutter up your mind with other thoughts. You have to realize that in this case, less is more. The fewer things you're thinking about, the more you'll see right here, right now. So whatever other concerns you may have about your situation at home, your situation at work, the world outside. Put those things aside for the time being.
and be as fully aware of the body, as fully aware of the breath as you can right now. Think of the breath as a whole body process. It's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs, but it's the flow of energy in the body, part of which is related to the flow of the blood, the sense of aliveness in your nerves. Try to be sensitive to the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out. Notice if there's any tension or tightness. Allow that to relax. If there's a sense of nourishment and refreshment, allow that to expand. Ask yourself, what would be the most refreshing way to breathe right now? See how the body responds. And stick with it, because it's in the sticking with it that the mind gets a sense of steadiness. And once it's steady, then it can begin to see other movements as they happen. For the time being, you don't want to pay any attention to them. You want to pay attention more to the movements of the breath. As for any other thoughts that come up, you can just let them go, let them go, let them go. Again, less is more. The fewer thoughts you have cluttering up your range of awareness, the more the breath can fill the range of awareness. The more sensitive you can become to how the breathing feels. And the more sensitive you are, the more likely the mind is to settle down, to have a sense of ease and well-being right here, right now. You iron out any. knots of tension in the body, knots of blockage in the breath. And the more demanding you are in this, the more subtleties you see. It's like being the, the princess who couldn't even have a pee under a mattress, under many mattresses. The difference here being that if you sense any little peas in the mattress. You take them out. That's the, the work at the beginning of the meditation, is ironing things out, smoothing things out. Asking questions about the breath. What breath would feel good now? What would feel good now? Because sometimes you can breathe in a way that's steadily the same for long periods of time, and other times one type of breathing will feel good for a couple breaths and then not so good, so you've got to change. The important thing is that you stay with the breath as your main topic. We're developing what, this, what is called singleness of preoccupation, which means both that you have one preoccupation, the breath, and you make it single. Your whole range of awareness is filled with breath energy flowing through the body, even around the body. Think of it as a cocoon around the body, protect you from outside energies. And see how long you can maintain that. It's an act of balancing. And as if you've ever noticed a person walking across a type road, the person doesn't stay balanced all the time. You can notice that they shift a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, and then they correct. one of those old-fashioned scales that would swing back and forth before it would finally come to balance. And if something tipped it in one direction, well, it would come back to balance again. It's this ability to regain your balance that's going to keep you there. Our minds are often like the minds of an addict, the sort of person who says, I've been smoking pot for the last five years, but now I'm totally clean, totally beyond that. That kind of attitude is going to get him back smoking pot pretty soon. The way to stay away from your addiction is to realize that okay, there are certain things that attract you, 
but you have to have antidotes for that. You have to be able to counter that, to bring yourself back into balance. To realize there's always a possibility of falling out of balance, but you can master the skills to get you back in. So that's what the directed thought and evaluation at the beginning of right concentration is all about. You find the mind slipping off the breath and you can get it back right away. It slips off in the other direction and get it back right away. You keep your balance no matter how much it wobbles. And then things will finally settle down and you'll get more and more absorbed into the breath. There's a greater sense of oneness, a greater sense of concentration, composure, assurance that this is where you really want to be and it's all right where it is right now. At that point you don't have to adjust the breath anymore or analyze it. Just stay full body, whole body, aware, aware, aware. And it's as if the, the awareness and the body penetrate each other. There's a strong sense of oneness there. It's from this oneness that we can begin to see things clearly. But the important thing at this point is just to make sure your foundation is strong. And you do whatever it is needed to maintain that sense of balance. You find, your, find the mind going into its old habits of trying to gather up this, gather up that. Remember, less is more. Just the breath, just the breath. You don't need anything else. If you give a lot of attention to the breath, you begin to see its potentials. Take advantage of its potentials. You find that a sense of ease and well-being with the breath can do a lot more for you than any amount of status, material gain, praise, outside pleasures, the dharmas of the world. The sense of ease and well-being that come from within, this is really all you need. Because they give you both a sense of well-being right now, also give rise to more mindfulness and the knowledge that can put an end to defilement. Which is an even greater example of the case of less is more. The fewer defilements, the more freedom you have. As the Buddha said, when he gained awakening, he dwelt with an unrestricted awareness, free from any attachments, free from any constriction. It's the greatest wealth there is.